five, four, three, two, and one. All right. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, I wanted to have a a, a very a very uh, well. Um, I'm getting my words mixed up. Good morning, everybody. We have a special guest today. Um, uh, she is uh, coming from us from Duke University. Her name is Miss Brittany Hegan. And just a little bit about Brittany. Um, she's in her fourth year uh, ECE PhD student at Duke University. Um, throughout her time at Duke, um, her research has focused on printed electronics, also utilizing electrically conductive inks for biomedical applications. Uh, very technical, very sophisticated, but we are very, very happy to have her here this morning. So without further ado, Ms. Brittany Hegan. Thanks, Henry. Um, like you said, my name is Brittany Hegan and I am a fourth year graduate student at Duke. Um, thanks for having me today. And I just wanted to go ahead and say that if you guys do have any questions that pop up during the presentation or comments or anything, you're welcome to stop me. Um, if I don't see you, just unmute yourself and come on in. Um, so throughout this talk, um, there's, oh, these are kind of the things that I want to go over. And my goals for the lecture is I kind of want to answer the questions of what are printed electronics, what kind of inks and substrates can be used for printed electronics, and what is an example application of printed electronics, and give you a little bit of a broad overview of my research. So we're going to go ahead and jump right on into it and discuss what are printed electronics. Well, printed electronics basically refers to a process in which printing technology is used to produce various kinds of electronic goods by electronic systems being adhered to a variety of materials, such as glass, capped on paper, and silicon. So basically, instead of etching away metal to make a circuit, conductive inks are placed down onto the substrate. The area of printed electronics, it's very wide and it includes a large number of different materials and printing technologies, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, but it first started to emerge as a potential low cost replacement to silicon based electronics and now it's pretty complementary to silicon based electronics and works with it. It's a relatively simple process and it's less time consuming and has less material waste than other processes. And another important advantage of it is that it has the possibility to produce electronics in a flex flexible um, very thin shape with a combination of specialty materials and low cost large area fabrication processes. They're lightweight, bendable, foldable, um, conformal, wearable, and offer the possibility of creating devices or sensors on a variety of substrates, like I said before. So what are some of the applications of it? One of the first applications, and this is not even close to all of them that I'll go through, but these are just some popular ones. Um, is medical sensing. So printed electronics, they have played a key role in medical wearables for several years now. And one of the earliest applications of this technology was the sensor and the glucose monitor for at-home diabetes testing. Um, since then, the technology has been used in products that adhere directly to skin, bandages, and other mobile surfaces. Another application is consumer products. Um, so if you think of the transistors that are in your screens um, and everything um, and in your phone. So basically printed electronics can provide a great functionality to devices, control panels, um, and even sometimes in clothing and other wearables made for everyday wear because they do have that flexible conductive inks um, and thin circuits. So another um, application that it can be used for is automotive industry. Um, and this is actually a rather new territory for printed electronics, but it is on the rise. Um, and when you think of what it could be used for for this, it could be used for printed heaters or organic LED lighting. Those are some of the examples for it. So there's many different types of ways that you can create printed electronics um, and many different printers that can be used for it. Um, so we're gonna go through some of that now. The four main printing techniques are inkjet, aerosol jet, screen stencil, or gravure, or roll-to-roll -roll printing. Basically, inkjet, when you think of that, just think of your normal everyday printer that you use to print it, um, your papers out on, whatever. Um, it's the same thing, but it just prints conductive inks, which I'll go through what conductive means in a little bit, um, instead of just normal ink. So it prints ink that can create um, electrical resistance. A major drawback to it though, is it's constraint to printing techniques with a narrow range of viscosities and densities of ink. Another method, which I'll get into this method a lot more later when I go through um, some applications and what my research is, is aerosol jet printing. 
And this is um, a relatively new method of printing, and it is an emerging contactless direct write approach aimed at the reduction of fine features on a wide range of substrates. And basically, it uses an aerodynamic focusing um, to precisely and accurately deposit electron inks into substrates. And again, we'll go over that one a little bit more later. Another method is screen or stencil printing, which uses a porous, porous mesh image carrier, which yields thicker ink deposits compared to other printing methods. So basically, there's a squeegee and a screen printing plate as the main component, and the screen printing plate has ink applied on top of it. And the squeegee is used to sweep the ink on top of the screen with the pressure and the ink passes through the screen and is transferred onto the substrate um, in order to create your device there. The last one that we're going to go through, which there's even more than this, but these are the main ones, is gravure or roll-to-roll -roll printing. Um, this one has a very high throughput and it's no, which means it can produce a lot. Um, and it's known for its high print quality, high print speeds, variable film thickness, and the use of low viscosity inks and the simplicity of transferring the ink onto the substrate. And basically how this works is you have a print plate that has an impression into it and ink is scraped across the plate with a doctor blade. So it's spread across it. And then the substrate is pushed into the plate and rolls over it. And so the impression that is made onto um, the plate is then pressed onto your substrate um, and transfers it there. So these are the main four types of printing. Um, and now we're going to kind of go through what kind of ink can be used for printed electronics. But a big thing that you need to understand before we do this is what kind of is electrical resistance um, in order to understand what types of inks can be used. So resistance is basically an opposition that an electrical device has to the flow of current. All devices do have a resistance basically, and a resistor itself is a device that has a particular resistance. Um, resistance is measured in the SI unit of ohms. And in order to understand resistance a little better, I'm gonna make an analogy to water flowing through a pipe. So as you can see in this image, um, when the resistance is bigger, so the bottom here, um, and the pipe is thinner, it creates a bigger resistance and the water flow is decreased because there's pressure coming back onto it. Whereas when you have less resistance and the pipe is wider and doesn't have that bend in the middle, there is nothing stopping the flow of water and thus there's less resistance. Um, so in order to predict the behavior of the material, you can use Ohm's law for that which is basically a relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. And it states that the voltage or potential difference between two points is directly proportional to the current or the electricity passing through the resistance, and also directly proportional to the resistance of the circuit. So whenever you want, so an analogy for this, kind of similar to the water flowing through the pipe, is basically like voltage is the pressure that pushes the water through the pipe, Whereas current is the diameter of the hose, the wider it is, the more water that will flow through. And resistance is like if you put sand in the hose, that slows down the water flow and gives it an obstacle. So if you change one of them in the circuit due to Ohm's law, the others will change too. So if you think about it, um, adding water in the pipe, if you add sand into the hose and you keep the pressure the same, it's like reducing the diameter of the hose and less water will flow. So as current increases, resistance will decrease if the voltage stays the same. So now that you kind of understand what electrical resistance is, we're going to go into basically the two main types of materials, which are conductors and insulators. So conductors are materials that offer very little resistance where electrons can move easily. So electrons are the water flow through the pipe um, or the material without much resistance. Um, and some examples of this are silver, copper, gold, aluminum. And insulators are basically the opposite of that where there's a lot of high resistance, a lot of stuff stopping that flow and restricting the flow of electro electrons so electricity doesn't flow through it. And examples of this are rubber, paper, glass, wood, and plastic. So there's a lot of other factors that can um, affect resistance, including the length, 
of the material, the cross-sectional area, the temperature, and the type of material. But the two main things that affect it are whether it's conductor or an insulator. So with that, you can have conducting or insulating inks. Each one has its own pros and cons. Um, some examples of conductive inks, which is what I work with a lot, are silver nanoparticles and silver nanowires. Um, they are very conductive um, and not very resistive, but the cons to it are that they do have a lot of post-processing techniques, including you have to center them. So basically heat them in an oven um, for an hour at high temperatures, um, whereas you don't have to do that with insulating inks. So now that you kind of understand what printed electronics are and what kind of inks can be used to create printed electronics, I'm going to go through a real life application of one and kind of what my research focuses on, which is a point of care performance time international normalized ratio test, which I know is a lot of words. We'll go through all of it. Um, but first, in order to understand why this is necessary, I need to give you a little bit of background on heart failure and some other stuff. So we're gonna go ahead and jump into that. So basically, um, most people do know what heart failure is, but it's a chronic disease that imposes significant burden on the healthcare system. And it happens when the heart can't pump enough blood and oxygen to support the other organs in the body. And it's a very common disease. About 6.2 million adults in the US have it with 26 million worldwide. And in, um, once you're diagnosed with heart failure, the risk of dying is very high. 50% die within five years and 90% within 10 years. In 2018, it was mentioned on almost 380,000 death certificates, and it cost the nation about $31 billion in 2012. As you can see on the map, in the map on the right side of the screen, it's very, very common throughout all of the U.S., not just certain areas. Um, and the most common treatment for this is getting a heart transplant, so a new heart. And although that sounds all dandy that there is a treatment for it, um, it's not great because each year there's more individuals that are in need of a heart transplant than the numbers of donors that are available, which leads to long waiting periods. And during those waiting periods, about 10 to 12 percent of patients die um, because they deteriorated um, or they just couldn't find a heart. So therefore there's things called mechanical circular, circulatory support devices. Um, and those are available to decrease that mortality rate. So one example of a mechanical circulatory support device is a ventricular assist device. And over 26,000 were implanted by 2018 and about 2,500 new implants occur annually. So what are these devices? Well, basically they're an implantable me mechanical pump that helps pump the blood from the lower chambers of the heart or the ventricles to the rest of the body. So basically it does what the heart is failing to do. Hence why it's one of the treatments for heart failure. Um, from from 2005 to 2011, the number of BADS per year increased from about 100 to 500, which decreased the in-hospital mortality rate from 47% from 12%. So not only do they prolong life, but they improve the quality of life and the functional capacity of these patients. And although that is true and that is great, the patients with these devices still do experience um, a lot of adverse side effects. And the most important of these side effects include bleeding, infection, and thrombosis. Throughout this talk, we're gonna focus on the thrombosis adverse side effect, which is basically when the blood clots and it blocks um, veins or arteries. So it stops that blood flow. And so the reason that this happened is because this device in their body is a foreign object to their body. And so their body thinks that they need to kick it out and try and get it out. So the blood clots in order to try and push it out. And so whenever this happens, these patients who have these devices in them need to take a medication or a powerful drug called Warfarin. And although it can save people's lives who are at risk or previously had blood clots, it's also important to remember that this medication can result in serious side effects. 
So the same action that prevents the blood from clotting can also result in your blood and bleeding and bleeding too much and your blood getting too thin. So there's a very careful balance um, of how much of this medicine people need to take. And certain factors can tip that balance very, very easily leading to incorrect dosing. And so what are the factors that can tip this balance? I'm not going to go into it in super depth um, just because there's a lot, but I will show you that there are a lot of illnesses, a lot of interactions with common drugs, a lot of supplements or food or herbs, um, vitamins, and changes in diets that can cause um, that balance to be tipped. And so in order to monitor that, something called PTINR, prothrombin time, international normalized ratio, must be monitored to help regulate the dosage of porphyrin. So you're probably wondering, what is PTINR? Well, it's the amount of time that it takes for blood to clot in your body. And so given that different laboratories may have slightly different reagents um, and procedures that may lead to variations in reported PT, INR is used to ensure that those deviations in measured PT are due to shift in the patient's actual clot time, as opposed to differences in the operating procedures. So there's an equation in order to calculate INR from PT. And basically in this equation, PT norm is the average clotting time for a healthy population. The PT patient is the measured clotting time of the patient that you're getting the INR of. And the International Sensitivity Index, or ISI, is just a function of some of the reagents that are used during testing. And so warfarin, as I said before, is known to have a very narrow therapeutic window. And if you go outside of it, you're at risk of clots or bleeding. And so people want to keep their INR between about 2 and 3, with the ideal being in the middle of that at 2.5, 2.6. And basically a prolonged PT, it means that blood is taking too long to form a clot and you're at a risk of bleeding. And a short PT means that the clot, your blood is clotting too quickly and you're at a risk of blood clots, which could cause a stroke or something. So how do people normally measure their PT INR? Well, it's normally measured in a laboratory um, and there's a lot of drawbacks to this. And basically it's because Every time a patient wants to get their PTINR tested, they have to go to the doctor's office and use the bulky, expensive equipment that's there um, and sit and wait to get a whole vial of blood drawn and then wait for their results, um, which just isn't ideal and kind of decreases that quality of life for these patients considering, I mean, everyone knows how going to the doctor is. It takes forever. <laughs> um, so it does decrease that quality of life. And so one way in order to overcome that and fix it is to create an affordable handheld whole blood point of care test. And so that's what my research focuses on. At home point of care tests can drastically increase the patient quality of life and improve outcomes for bad patients because it does allow for more frequent testing and early diagnosis of issues. There was a study done to analyze um, the efficacy of outpatient anti, um, anticoagulation monitoring in patients who did have a bad implantation between 2011 and 2016. And in this study, the home monitoring patients had biweekly measurements of their INR, whereas the standard of care patients had it measured every one to three weeks. They were able to see that the standard of care patients were more likely to have ischemic cardiomyopathy, which is basically a narrowing of the coronary arteries, which supply blood to the heart, um, with 63% versus 30% um, of patients in standard care versus home monitoring. In addition, the use of home monitoring was associated with a 19.7% reduction in the risk of gastrointestinal bleeding, and it also trended towards a lower risk of thrombosis, which again is when your blood clots. And lastly, the thing that I want to point out with this is patients with home monitoring um, it did have a longer time in the therapeutic range, which is basically in that two to three range of INR with home monitoring patients having it at 52% and standard of care having it at 39% of the time. So there are... Um, commercial point of care INR devices that operate on finger stick blood that have been available for more than 30 years. 
And more than a dozen of these have been introduced um, in that time using various mechanisms for de determining the PTINR, which we're not really going to go through a lot, but just know that there are a lot of different ways that you can do it. There are a lot of issues with these devices, though, such as the first one being the required volume of blood in order to, for these tests to run. So for reference, normally when you prick your finger, it produces about three to five microliters of blood. Um, and these tests require at minimum eight microliters. So you really either have to stick your finger multiple times or you really got to squeeze your finger to work to get enough blood out for these tests to run. The next issue is that the cost point doesn't enable more ubiquitous use in assessing the warfarin dosing as most units cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars and each test strip is more than $5 and between five and 10. Now, although that might not seem like a ton when you're testing your INR, let's say a minimum of three times weekly, it really does add up. More importantly, there's been a lot of studies that evaluate the reliability of these point of care INR devices against gold standard. And they had a lot of poor correlation to that. Um, there's also been several other studies that have highlighted the increased bias in various point of care INR devices as the INR increases above 3.5, which again, isn't that far outside of what you want that therapeutic range to be. So it's not super high. There's a study that reported that when the point of care INR value was above four, it would have led to a different warfarin dosing than lab-based results for over 80% of patients. And one long-term goal of creating this device is to basically achieve a more precise personalized dosing algorithm for warfarin, for warfarin therapy that would basically require the generation of novel data set, sets that include frequent INR readings um, and relevant patient data information. And from this, machine learning models will be developed that account for patient-specific response to warfarin and enable precision dosing and maximization of the time in the INR therapeutic range. So therefore, if readings at a high level of INR, let's say 3.5, would cause a collection of inaccurate data that feeds the machine dosing model, then it would um, increase how many people are told to take the incorrect amount. Another big issue with it is that the major point of care INR devices have also struggled with consistent performance from their disposable test strips with a lot of them creating class one recalls from the FDA, which is the most um, offensive recall. The last thing that I wanna say is the one that actually does um, work the best has an extensive multi-step process to operate. So with this, it's just to show that there are a lot of devices out there, but they're still not accurate, they're high cost, and there's still need for a better one. So before I go into how my device works, um, I kind of need to explain what impedance is. And if you know what resistance is, which I explained earlier, then understanding impedance will be decently easy. So basically with resistance, it sends in a direct current of electricity and voltage. So basically um, it's a steady amount that goes in um, and it's DC. Whereas impedance has AC electricity, so basically it sends in an alternating current like a sinusoidal wave. Um, so with this, it kind of changes a little bit what um, you get out of it. So with resistance, you, it depends on the resistivity and the size of the circuit components, whereas impedance depends on the resistance and the reactance of the components. Um, although they're similar, they are denoted by a different letter, whereas resistance is R and impedance is D, they're both still measured in ohms. Um, another difference is that resistance is independent of the supply frequency, whereas impedance does vary with it. Resistance is an electrical property, whereas impedance is a combination of electrical and electromagnetic properties. Resistance is independent of the phase difference between voltage and current whereas impedance decides the phase shift between them, again, because it's sinusoidal waves coming in. And then lastly, resistance is expressed in real numbers, whereas impedance is expressed in complex numbers. So going with that, my research focuses on an impedometric um, INR test. And this was first um, introduced in the 1970s. And basically it was introduced and 
it said that the impedance minimum in a time versus impedance curve indicates the clotting time. They said it was an ideal choice because the measurement and platform itself are very simplistic, it's low cost, highly sensitive, um, and it's more reproducible than mechanical tests due to the lack of moving components. And it's been shown to yield results that um, correlate with the gold standard methods. So ever since 1970s, 1970 when this came out, there's been a lot of interest in developing this even further. And a lot of these techniques um, involve clean room fabrication, which you guys might not know what that means, but just know it increases the cost and complexity of um, fabricating this device significantly. So one way to overcome this is by fully printing the sensors. And so as I said before, I print the sensors using an aerosol jet printer. Um, this printer basically prints nanomaterial inks to create low cost electronic sensors, and it has emerged as a powerful approach for a wide variety of applications due to the ability to fabricate a device that circumvents the need for an expensive clean room processing. And again, that's because it creates a low cost mass free device production and it's attractive for rapid throughput manufacturing out of manufacturing out a fraction of the cost of competing approaches. There's a lot of benefits to it, such as the ability to print on non-planar surfaces, print high aspect ratio nanomaterial-based inks, um, and to print inks with a broad range of viscosity. So how does the printer work? Well, basically the aerosol jet printer functions by aerosolizing ink in an enclosed cartridge, cartridge using ultrasonic transduction, which is shown here. The ink cartridge is then pressurized with an inert gas called the atomizer flow, which guides the ink to the printer nozzle. Once it's at the printer nozzle, a secondary inert gas comes in um, called the sheath flow, which blankets the ink stream and prevents the ink from contact with the printer nozzle so it doesn't clog the nozzle. Um, and it concentrates the ink towards the substrate surface. Aerosol jet printing has been used to successfully fabricate numerous devices, including basic electronic components, such as transistors, sensors, and even some biological materials. So for my device, I first have to clean and prep a glass slide or a cap on or whatever substrate I'm using. Most of the time I use a glass slide. I then print silver nanoparticle traces and pads, and I center them at 200 degrees Celsius for one hour. The reason why I center them um, is because the uh, nanoparticles, whenever they're heated at 200 degrees Celsius, they melt some and coalesce together to create that conductiveness. After I do that, I do an optional step um, of printing carbon nanotubes or silver nanowires as a resistive bridge um, in order to enhance the signal. I then place a gasket or well over the active area to contain the blood. I then mix blood with the reagents. Um, and the reason that I do this is because the blood that we use, since it's not fresh blood coming straight out of a finger and it comes from a lab, it does have something called K2EDTA in it, which basically prohibits the blood from clotting until I'm ready for it to. And so the addition of these reagents of Inovim and calcium basically um, overwhelms the ability, the chelating ability, and it allows for the blood to again clot. And then once I do that, I deposit the blood and I start the measurement. Um, so again, as I just said before, I do an impedance-based measurement, um, similar to the one that was discovered in the 1970s. Um, and I replicate an original impedance curve, which is shown on the right here, that is uh, yields a consistent and re re reproducible response. Um, so as you can see here, the blood before it clots has a low viscosity and kind of behaves like a liquid before it reaches this impedance maximum. And then after the maximum impedance, it has more of a gelatinous state um, and a thicker viscosity. And the impedance change for this is caused by the sedimentation. So blood is made up of red blood cells and plasma. And whenever blood clots, basically the red blood cells separate from the plasma and, and sediments down onto the electrodes, which is measuring the impedance. 
And red blood cells are known to have conductivities that are almost 30 to 40 times lower than that of plasma. So a lower conductivity means higher impedance. And so as they displace onto my electrodes, it increases that impedance and causes that maximum. So something to take note of is I'm sure you're wondering why this is the minimum and this is the maximum and what the difference is there. And the difference is due to the electrode placement um, and it creates an inverse curve. And this is because in that original test back in the 1970s, Basically, the red, these are the electrodes and the red blood cells deposit between the electrodes, whereas the plasma stays on top of them. And so it actually causes an inverse effect. So um, the next thing that I'm going to go through is kind of this is what my testing setup looks like. Originally, when I first started doing this, the testing setup was not um, point of care and handheld and it um, involved being connected to a computer. Um, and it was in, so I had a device that did the measurement um, and then the computer showed the results. So my next step was to create it to be a handheld device. And this is what it ultimately looked like. Um, and how I did this was I created a new circuit design to achieve the required sensitivity with components that were also low cost. It consisted of um, a housing case or that all the components went into that was 3D printed. Um, it also had, again, my printed sensor there that would enter into the case for testing. It had a touch screen um, that was as an interface that showed the results, as you can see here, that was programmed um, to show everything through this interface system that connected to it. Um, and then lastly, and most importantly, it had the measurement system. Well, it also had a battery that powered it, but it had a measurement system um, that took all the measurements. So how it took the measurements was basically it sent a known voltage. Uh, it sent a voltage throughout a known resistor that we knew the impedance of that was in series with the unknown resistance of my device. And what happened was we would measure the resistance over the known resistor, which through Ohm's law, we could then calculate the current um, with V equals IR, or I would equal V over R then. And since um, this isn't something I just explained too much, but when devices are in series, they have the same current. And so since this resistor is in series with my device, we, it would let us know what the current was here. And so then we would measure the voltage over here too, which would then we'd be able to calculate the resistance of my electrodes and what was placed onto my electrodes in the blood. And so with that, how we program this chip um, in, order, in order to get filtering done um, and create a less noisy device and to throw out um, some that might have measured in air is we would measure 55 times and it was at a frequency of 15,000 Hertz. And so it measured very, very frequently. So every 55 times that it measured, it would come back to the measurement system and it would order those um, results from least to greatest, and then it would knock out the highest 10 values and the lowest 10 values, and then average the other 35 values before sending it to the interface subsystem, which would then send it to the touch screen for results. And so that's basically how my device would work. Um, it did, as you can see here, it did show um, results that did correlate with the palm sense in the computer tethered system that we used before. So there's a lot of other stuff with this device that I could show you that I've done outside of this, but um, I figured this was a lot to take in for now, so I would stop here. But basically, I just wanna go over a lecture recap, um, and I hope throughout this, you're able to learn kind of what are printed electronics, what can be used to print electronics um, from the ink to the printer type to the substrates, um, and you kind of learned a little bit about an example application of printed electronics. Thanks. This was phenomenal. Soon to be Dr. Hegan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
I yeah. have to jump. I have to jump the line. I have to jump the line for questions if that's okay. <laughs> Go ahead. <Absolutely. laughs> no, I know. I know our instructors will get the you know everybody else ready, but I have a few clarifying questions because I've already been thinking about additional applications. So yeah. to start from the beginning with recapping. I see so many uses for what you've been developing. Thank you so much for focusing on this number one, um, mm -hmm. especially when we talk about the communities that we target. This is an issue, right? Um, you know, when we talk about heart failure, we talk about blood clotting, et cetera. This is a tremendous issue. And so it's something that we definitely need to pay attention to. I also see that this is a game changer when we consider the, um, when we consider how telehealth is only going to expand. Um, so I have a clarifying question. So did you say that you can actually print your chip for this device or do you source your chip from somewhere else? The actual um, testing chip, so this I print. Everything else um, is a circuit board of some sort that is not printed. That is really good to know. So you, you can print your chip. And the reason I put an emphasis on that is because what we know overall in the tech sector, and especially what we saw during the pandemic, when we talk about materials overall, there was danger. And we saw a lot of, we're seeing a lot of price increases because there was a shortage of supply for, you know, chips in particular. And so Although um, bringing it back to what you're doing with you being able to manufacture, and, and, and I'll put quotes around that, manufacture uh, your chip for this device, I think that's something that our students and all of our ecosystems should really pay attention to, um, you know, for future endeavors or whatnot. The other, the other thing, just switching topics, um, when thinking about this, I think about how maybe a Serena Williams would have benefited from this type of device when, you know, she suffered from, you know, the blood clots on, on the plane. I think about how, um, when we think about maternal health and um, after the birthing process, and even particularly in the black community, um, because we know that the um, mortality rate um, for black mothers after they're given birth is incredibly high. So those are some of the things that came to mind as you were sharing um, your research. And I just wanted to say, I'm super excited. I have a lot more to say, but I want to give the room to everybody else, but I had to jump the line to say that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Ms. Brittany, uh, very, very, very interesting, uh, very fascinating. Um, I know from our previous um, uh, instructor lecturers, uh, printed electronics was the common theme. Right, so I know that our students, uh, we introduced them to solar uh, power, you know, items on Monday. Um, they started creating a dream room, like almost in a 3D, you know, type of realm, you know, like a, almost like like a, like a multiverse, you know, type. Um, like with with all of your research, like how much construction? Because we've gone through the phase of you know uh, almost having something come to fruition, from sketching it out to trying it, to thinking about it, to redoing it. Like when you printed these electronics, like what was the process in you even, you know, thinking about what to print? Like for our students say, like, what did you go through from uh, point one to point 10 for this to be a final product? Mm, great question. It's still not a final product. <laughs> um, it, when I came in to the lab, it was already a project that was ongoing. Um, actually, Dr. Williams, he was my mentor and had the project before me and passed it on to me. Um, but there's a lot of steps that you have to go through. There is a lot of failure before you reach success. Um, and for it to be a final product, yeah, you do have to test a lot of different um, schematics for a lot of different ways to do it. So actually, currently right now, one thing that I'm working on doing is creating simultaneous testing for it to where it actually runs two tests at the same time to see if um, they complete, like if they have the same PTINR, just because that will help increase the sensitivity and accuracy of the device. And so with that, I've gone through probably 10 different sensor designs. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what does work, what doesn't work. And then not only is it the sensor designs that I have ran through multiple different methods of trying, it's also the programming of the boards and the circuitry of the device. So. 
there's a lot. There's a lot. Um, one thing that a lot of people say is research is a lot of failure before you find success. <laughs> well, well, yeah. Um, uh, like, like when trying to explain to our students that, you know, maybe the first prototype, you know, is exactly that, uh, the first prototype. I, I know we made a reference to uh, Iron Man, you know, like an Iron Man 3, he had like over 85 different suits. And mm -hmm. I say if there would have been an Iron Man 4, he might have had over 100, you yeah. know, meaning that like you're always, um, but I just sort of, I just thank you for, for allowing the students to see the process that during this process of inventions, during this process of creations, you know, it takes time. You had to think about it from a different angle. You always have to be almost uh, asking yourself, you know, how can I make this better and more, more efficient and more uh, mm -hmm. concrete um, for the better good. So I just appreciate the process. And I know it was, it was very technical, um, you know, but, but I, I wanted the, the students to at least um, appreciate the process of going through um, this, this situation. Yeah, of course. Thank you. I'd like to add one more thing before we get to our students, and I'll leave that to Miss Elise and Mr. Henry to make sure, uh, you know, you can gauge if they have questions or to help prompt them with some. But overall, I'm hoping not only, you know, our students, but all those that are registered for Tech Remix this week, uh, they're able to see what they can aspire to be. So there are so many paths, uh, uh, you know, to achieving a, a particular state in tech. Um, and research is a huge one. <laughs> and so I, I think by having exposure to our academics this week, um, having exposure to careers and you know, other forms of education, other realms of education, to seeing how these careers can expand to being on founder teams, being a part of a team that's bringing something to the market, um, or even being on the side of helping to promote these technologies or being on the side of investing and supporting these technologies. So there are so many roles involved in this. And one of the key things that I love that you said soon to be Dr. Hegan is that of failure. Um, it's important to fail fast, to not repeat mistakes and to keep going. So this overall experience, I think helps to amplify that particular notion that a lot of times what we see or deem to be an overnight success has just been many years <laughs> of working and, and perfecting and improving ourselves in the process. So with that, Ms. Elise and, and Mr. Henry, uh, I know our students, we got some really, really bright students in this class. So I know they gotta have something that they wanna ask or share. Well, I know, um... I'm going to uh, sort of put her on a spot because she's asked some really good questions. But Karen, um, you had a question about, you know, the printed electronics and, and solar panels um, the other day. Uh, why don't you ask that same question to Ms. Brittany to see, um, you know, like what her take is on that? Um, are you talking about the one if you can like print silicone or the mm -hmm. one if you can like invent gold, combine gold and silicone together? I like the silicone and then also about like the, the, the like the solar panel, like uh, mm -hmm. to just see, like, just see where your thoughts are about that. Cause like you're really onto something. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm making this um, panel that goes onto the phone case. So I was wondering um, if you could actually like create something that you can print like silicone. You can definitely print on silicone. So a good, um, advantage of printed electronics is the wide variety of substrates that you can print onto and include with it. Um, if that's what you're asking about. Um, what type of things can you print on silicone? You can print whatever ink that you want, basically. Um, I know, so in our lab, the main inks that we use um, are, again, silver nanoparticles, silver nanowires. A lot of people use CNTs, um, sort of and unsorted, graphene, um, CNC is a big one. Let's see. I feel like those are the main inks that we use in our lab. Um, and again, anything that you can print, you can print onto whatever substrate you desire. So Again, um, Dr. Williams, which I know is in this chat, one of his things that he did in his research was he actually printed onto his finger and was able to show that like he could um, put an LED on there and a voltage through his finger in order to light an LED. So 
again, that's one of the main um, advantages of printed electronics is what you can print onto. And then again, the wide variety of things that you can print. So. Um, can you use um, liquid gold as ink? You can, I believe. Okay. Uh, our lab does not do it, but. Okay, I was just wondering. A great question. Um, and I know we have some more architectural um, engineers. And so I know uh, this is for um, uh, Ms. Jamal. Uh, like you, you did such a great job uh, with our dream room. When you look at this, the current screen and see like those six figures, like what does that show you about how to be able to use like the dream room capabilities of constructing in this? So like, like Jamal, come on, come on Mike for a second and see like, um, like how would you um, almost explain what's going on in this screen in terms of um, like the manipulation? Like you just showed us uh, just a minute ago uh, with your dream room. Um, so like what they're doing is like they're creating layers, mm -hmm. like the online tech thing, and they're using the layers each way, and then um, they're able to use it to understand what they're doing more easily, and they can like three D print it. Right. So like, how important would it be to know about layers when creating things? So like. Layers instead of like it's like uh, some uh, you can reference it back to drawing. When you got to draw in layers, you can't just draw one everything at once. It's not gonna look right, and it's not gonna come out right. Right. Very good. Very good. And so um, we're just trying to you know loop everything in, but uh, but but uh, and actually uh, uh, Jamal, come on camera just for just just so we can wave to you real quick because like you have a great <laughs> you have great thought process so just come on camera um how you doing um but she did an excellent job in terms of our dream house along with our other students as well um but uh like, like her her specific talk about layers i just sort of wanted to bring you know what they're doing to what you just presented um mm -hmm. with this you know a picture from the starting point um to the ending point in terms of, of layers so it's just one of those we always try to make that connection uh, with our students but uh jamal did a really good job as long as our, as long uh as well as our other students as well so good kids i'm not dogging you out <laughs> i'm just oh no you know, just, uh, it I love the connection um, because they were doing ThinkCAD or TinkerCAD. And so uh, using an AutoCAD type of environment, we can see how the application is being used even in your PowerPoint uh, to have that 3D appeal. Um, so Jamal did a great job along with Behan and uh, several of the others, Karen. Um, so yes, I can definitely see how they work together. We have a few questions in the chat. We just want to make sure some of those could be addressed and uh, kind of assisting with some plain language for those that are watching and may be watching in the future. So uh, Ms. Lisa, Mr. Henry, if you could share those with Ms. Hegan uh, related to the ink. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so Ms. Brittany, um, like where do you source the ink from? Um, so we, there are some people that make our, um, that make ink in the lab for silver nanowires, but mostly we purchase our ink um, from companies. Okay, okay. And then also, uh, can these experiments be tried at home or do they have to be done in a lab you know, or, or in a facility? I would recommend that they're done in a lab, definitely. Um, especially if you're doing aerosol jet printing and stuff, that is a like, I think three to $500,000 machine. So it's not something you could, that could be done um, at home. If you're doing inkjet printing, mm -hmm. I guess that could be if you can get a hold of some ink. Um, but I would recommend it be done in a lab for sure for safety precautions. But absolutely, absolutely. And definitely don't work with blood at home. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Make sure uh, you, know, you use safety precautions for that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, definitely safety first. One hundred percent safety first. Um, well, like uh, Ms. Brittany, would you have any recommendations of uh, platforms that the students can use now just to get acclimated to this process? Um, I know that that, that we have um, uh, incorporated uh, Scratch, uh, Roblox, 
uh, you know, going uh, with Tinkercad? Would there be any other uh, programs that, that you recommend our students to get acclimated with so they could, you know, go into this field and then feel more comfortable about it? Um, I think AutoCAD is a great program. That's what we use to design all of our prints. Um, so I think that would be a good start. Also, if you're looking at the circuitry side, um, just any kind of programming, getting some background in that would be good. Um, outside of that, I don't use a ton of programs. MATLAB, MATLAB is great for coding. I do a lot of filtering of my results in there. Um, and to get images and everything. I think that's about it, honestly. Okay, great, thank you. But if they want more background outside of programs, um, just going on Google Scholar and reading journal articles that are related to topics you're interested in can never hurt either. Got it, and you, you said Google Scholar, correct? Yeah, Google Scholar, just basically, it's where you can find a lot of journal articles related to certain research, so. If you're interested in it, you can always read about it more from there um, and just search for articles. Very good. Now, now I know uh, the sort of speaking for the students, um, they're in a sort of like the sense of, you know, uh, information in terms of, you know, TikTok and, you know, social media. Would, 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 would there be uh, uh, maybe um, a plan B if the journal, um, you know, were, were, were a little bit lengthy and like they wanted something, something more, 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 more quick access or would Google Scholar be the best place to start? And uh, I mean, you can get something quicker. Yeah. And you can look at that stuff, but, but it's also something you always have to remember. You don't know how reliable it is. I feel like when you find stuff on TikTok and whatnot, but even with journal articles, if you don't want to read the whole thing, reading the abstract and maybe the introduction and looking at the figures and conclusion is always a great start for people. Okay. Very good, thank you. Instead of reading through the whole ten pages or whatever it is. Yeah, oh yeah, just trying to you know give give some uh, other supplemental resources. Um, yeah, of course. All right, great, uh, Miss Elise. Did you have any 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 other questions or anything to add? Well, I noticed that there was a question in the chat. Um, is there a certain ink color that's best for testing? Was that mentioned? ink color. Yeah. Um, the color doesn't necessarily matter. It's always the material. So um, when I am saying gold and silver ink or um, carbon ink or whatever, it's always referring to those materials, not necessarily the color of the ink. Okay. Are those materials highly toxic? Is that? They can be, um, yeah but they're not always, <laughs> okay. but yes, they definitely have potential to be, especially when you're aerosolizing it into the air and you have the particles floating around. Great, great. Well, I tell you, this was another expansive, expanding our mind um, presentation and we definitely thank you. We thank you for sure. being here soon to be Dr. Brittany Higgins. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and Dr. Williams, we thank you again for joining us. And each and every one of you, class, it's been amazing. Yeah, Back it really, you. it really has. It really has. Um, I know we will um, turn over to uh, Miss Lakeisha uh, as we conclude. I know that um, students, we're going to put our Jamboard um, link into the chat so you can talk about today.